And um, you have supported African countries to do PPPs or done PPPs in different regions of the world. And PPPs are considered one of the important ways of, in, of bringing in investment, and especially in the energy sector that the Honorable Minister heads. Um, what lessons would you like to share with us? And also, how do you look at that in terms of raising investment for renewable energy products? Thank you. Thank you. And so first, you know, congratulations to the minister for those excellent remarks. Very encouraging. Um, just a minute on the context is that, uh, you know, the, the World Bank Group's mandate or mission uh, is to reduce poverty, and the only sustained pathway out of poverty is jobs. And to be able to create jobs, uh, especially in the real sector, you know, critical is the quality of infrastructure amongst many other factors in a country. And so this session is particularly important, and I think earlier this year, the World Bank and the African Development Bank came together for a compact that, you know, Africa still has 50% of its population without access to energy. And I think connecting at least 300 million to the grid to quality, reliable energy is, is a priority. So again, this session is really important. And then all the energy of the future is going to be from cleaner sources of energy. So it's more on renewable energy. And I think we've been seeing a significant uh, upward trend of renewable energy projects, especially in Eastern Africa and across all sources, so solar, wind, geothermal, bioenergy, uh, various sources. But the amount of bankable projects um, is still very low. Uh, and whether it's pure private investments or PPPs in renewable energy in particular, uh, these are not easy, these are long gestation projects and I think, um, as was mentioned by one of the investors, you know, given the time that it takes to design, develop and get these operational, there are four lessons that we've seen cutting across emerging markets, not only in East Africa but across emerging markets, uh, that we think is important um, for us to share. Uh, one is, I think, very strong political commitment and uh, le the leadership at the top truly uh, wanting um, genuine private sector participation because most countries are currently fiscally constrained and there's limited public resources available for infrastructure development. So inviting responsible private sector to participate um, in, in infrastructure service provision is very important, but it's a big mindset shift to move from a status quo of public sector delivery of infrastructure to inviting the private sector. So I think what we heard from the minister, strong political leadership and commitment from the top is absolutely fundamental and it needs to be sustained over a period of time. Uh, the second thing that we've seen is basically transparency. Again, we spoke about it in a previous section, institutional capabilities and, and, and uh, you know, transparency of processes uh, is absolutely important. It can't be uh, regular changes in the op authorizing environment because that again puts investors in a, in a place of discomfort. Uh, the third one is technical capabilities, not only because the private sector is going to come in a, with a pretty good, strong, legal, financial, technical team, and it's important that the government also is equally uh, technically capable of dealing and contesting and, and, and dialoguing with the private sector, so building these capabilities. And fourth, I think, irrespective of which sector it is in infrastructure, a stakeholder management, an active communication with all of the stakeholders, both businesses, households, uh, various other you know, stakeholders in the community of trying to explain why you're bringing in the private sector, which sectors, what kind of expected benefits do you see. That kind of stakeholder engagement from the very outset in a transparent manner is very important for success. And we've seen a few uh, transactions in East Africa. We, we, we not only work on the legal regulatory issues, we also work on capacity building. We help in developing bankable projects. Uh, we also serve as a transaction advisor. We also invest in PPPs. There are different units in the World Bank Group that serve all of these functions. And we've been able to close some in the renewable energy, especially in hydro and solar in the region. We're exploring a number of other new renewable energy projects in, in Africa more broadly. And we stand committed to support this, but there's lots of issues around regulation, you know, tariff regulations, the regulatory reform and the unbundling, you know, uh, willingness to invite part private participation in the transmission sector in particular. The minister referred to mini-grids, off-grids. Um, 
you know, rooftop solar, these are all projects that we have supported in different jurisdictions, but they all require a lot of clarity in the rules of how the contract will be designed and how will it be overseen. So there are examples. The first thing we do with governments around the world is with, before we get started, just share lessons of what others have done, what has worked, what has not worked, because not all models are successful, and I think we're all learning in the process. There's a lot of knowledge out there that we'll be happy to share, and again, it's an honor to be part of this session today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, when I come to uh, Dr. Ramadan, you, in the energy sector, you have to raise lots of financing to support the oil and gas sector. Um, there is the upstream work, there is the refinery, there is the crude oil pipeline, uh, there is transmission of electricity, there is the generation plants that should be coming up shortly. So you have a constrained envelope. Um, we just want to hear from you. What are your plans to address this? And how do you see yourself uh, being able to raise the capacity of government to deliver on these projects? Thank you. Thank you. Um, the plan is simple, is to raise money. <laughs> and uh, I'm here to raise money. First, we have uh, our traditional partners we are working with. They could be um, not interested in certain areas, but definitely it's a value chain. They support those areas where uh, they are comfortable. I'm talking of the World Bank, I'm talking of uh, with its uh, sister IFC. We are working closely uh, together especially in building infrastructure and also supporting the private sector that is uh, partaking in this. But also, we are now working very aggressively on public-private partnerships. Our frameworks are ready. They have been tested. We have seen where there are challenges in delaying um, processing of projects by especially the private sector, and we are addressing them. But we are also coming at a time when the green financing aspect is in-house, and uh, we've been able to work on the fiscal frameworks. In my ministry now, we have a climate financing unit, full-fledged, and uh, we are working closely with our multilateral partners to fine tune it and mobilize financing from that angle as well. But the big money comes from the private sector because that's where the money is and I am I'm here really to interest the audience here in the opportunities my minister has been talking about. And I think he made a point of um, risk aversion. There's a lot of risk aversion in the West. There are so many opportunities. And Africa now is the land of these opportunities. When if you look around very closely. And there are those people who are taking advantage of these opportunities. They are mainly coming from other places. I don't see them here. From the East, from the Middle East. And they are coming and we are doing business with them. I would really want to say, if you want to make money in the next two decades, get to the plane, come to Africa, we process for you these opportunities. If you wait on, these opportunities will not wait. They are going to certain categories of people. This is the message I want to be clear in the room. I see uh, a lot of, uh, you know, caution and carefulness and so many questions. There are people who don't ask those questions and they are getting these opportunities. I want to tell you the truth. And um, we are closing a lot of big deals in Africa, particularly now in Uganda. 
with some particular kinds of people. When I talk like this, I'm sure everybody in the room knows what I'm talking about. And um, I would want our traditional partners in development, the United Kingdom, to take full advantage of the opportunities before us. And we work together to develop these ATMs to bridge the infrastructure gap in Africa. Talk about the infrastructure gap, for example. In the past two decades, who has played the biggest role? Where has this money come from that has built the infrastructure in Africa? Because we have closed it, I think, in the last two decades, much faster than in the previous century. And uh, we have now electricity, we have highways connecting all of corners of the country. We have um, uh, the railway lines which are being revamped. We have the IT, uh, you know, national backbones, fiber laid across the continent and younger people uh, connecting themselves in the gig economy and so on. This man has come from different places. And I would want to encourage the investors in this part of the world to really pick a leaf from this and we move uh, uh, together. Mm. Thank you so much. Um, before, we, before we come to the audience, I'd just like the minister to have a rejoinder. Um, I think some of what you've said has tickled her and she'd just like to say a few words before we ask for questions. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, that I was concerned about the time that we take to issue a license. Six months is too long. But I wanted the audience to appreciate the factors, the key factors that sometimes make us delay, especially if you are to, to uh, invest in mineral and oil. The issue of access to land there's no way I can give you a mining license when you have not accessed the land. We have four land tenure systems in Uganda, whereby one tenure system places ownership of land into the hands of the people to own land in perpetuity. You get your land title, that is your land. And most people have inherited this land. One of them, land can belong to government. Where land belongs to government, access to that becomes easier. In Tanzania, land belongs to government. So when it came to the East African crude oil pipeline development, Tanzania moved very fast. While Uganda was negotiating with the people who own land, and the moment you get one challenge from one project affected person, then the world zeroes on you. Civil society organization, you know, you have to clear World Bank projects. You have to make sure that you have compensated people. So because of that, you take a long time to issue such licenses. But where you don't require access first, like a prospecting license, to just organize your papers, and tomorrow I issue a prospecting license. You know? Exploration license, I have to introduce you to the local governments. Once I do that, you begin digging and carrying out samples. I give you the export license. So I wanted you to appreciate our land tenure system, that sometimes we, we, we get problems, challenges with project affected people where somebody says, over my dead body, I'm not moving away. And you have to negotiate. This is my ancestral land. This is where my great grandfathers were buried. I'm not moving away. And where you say you compulsory acquire because our constitution gives government mandate to compulsory acquire but you have to be prompt in paying and adequate. So what does adequate mean? So that can take you to court. I wanted to make this explanation 
so that you come down knowing that you have to be a little bit patient with us. One president had banned this kind of tenure system, Idi Amin. Idi Amin said, oh, you know, no Milo land, no what? But that caused him problems. So when President Seven took power, he placed land back into the hands of the communities and individuals, and people were happy. So we are managing it. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Minister. I think that was very clear. And I see we have experts in land here, and the authorities responsible as well. I think they'll address any further questions that you have. Now, uh, in the next five minutes, as we come towards the end of this session, I'd like to ask the audience to ask uh, any questions you may have. And uh, I think we start from Her Excellency, the High Commissioner. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, uh, everybody, for your uh, comments. And my question is for um, Ms. Dasgupta from IFC. Just wanted to know now, in terms of the bank perspective, how long are you now looking at projecting and giving financing to private sector through the IFC for these small pri for the smaller private companies to do a PPP, especially from within the region, which includes local content as part of the guarantees? Thank you. Well, we get a lot of inquiries here in the mission, so that's why I'm asking you. Thank you. So the 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 tenor for the projects in for the for the IFC the private sector is it starts at seven eight years and goes even longer uh, depending on the on the tenor of of the project you know if it's PPP in power it often goes even longer um, some of the smaller PPPs like rooftop solar etc uh, it could be a little smaller but you know the tenor of the project is not fixed it all depends on the sector. Okay. <laughs> uh, again, depends. De depends on yes. So you know, we are not the swiftest uh, uh, organization because we also don't crowd out the private sector, the investment banks that can do it faster. Because we are, at the end of the day, an organization that works with our shareholders, which is the governments around the world. Um, and so we have made agility quite an important part of our process. So there are record deals in in like in 90, 100 days. Uh, and there are some, like the complicated projects and infrastructure, you know, do take a lot of due diligence, right? There's a lot of environmental social safeguards that we need to be mindful of. I think the minister very eloquently articulated some of these issues around displacement, around land rights, uh, and there are lots of sensitive issues that need to be mindful of. In the context of infrastructure, it does take a while. Thank you so much. Uh, please, next question. interesting discussions we are having this afternoon. One of the points that was made this afternoon was take the flight and come to Uganda. My question is, there are no direct flights from... from <laughs> <laughs> I would like to take a direct flight. When is that happening? Thank you. Um, I think we have someone from Uganda Airlines who is here. <laughs> Who said that? I, I think Jennifer is here, is going to have a, a session and she's going to tell you the good news because we are about to get to a direct flight to come back. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Doctor. Um, just the last two questions and then we shall be done. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Pereza Chiang, and uh, I've been in this convention from the beginning. So 14 years down the line, we are still here. And uh, the comment and the question I want to ask is in relation to the progress we've made over the 14 years. And I'm very sure, uh, um, Your Excellency, you've been in a lot of these sessions as well. As part of the diaspora, part of our remit as uh, people who are still connected to our land is that we are able to introduce new ideas and new technologies to the Africa from where we have learned in Europe. I'm sitting here in this session today because part of some of the colleagues I brought to speak about today is about energy. And I thought this session is so important because everything we produce is energy related. If you look at the trends in UK now when it comes to importing your goods, because this is a big session again in the afternoon, looking at opening up markets 
for Uganda goods or Kenya goods for that matter. We have been called as a company so many times to do a market access initiative for particular products or more products at the embassies here. But I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, your wishes and desires are not really connected to the markets. So when we are talking about importing new goods. The trends now in Europe now are looking at sustainability. They are looking at the use of alternative green energy. And when I sit and I'm thinking, yes, we're investing more in the oil and gas, but how does this relate to the new opportunities in green energy? And how does this make your products more appealing to the UK and European community? And is this something of concern? And if it is, in here today we are sitting with experts that have previously invited you to come and see the hydrogen innovation in its start and how it is progressing. And whether some of these green skills and technologies we are talking about are sitting here right before you today and the opportunities to take at this summit. And whether okay. these are part of what we can begin to say are ticking the boxes of which summit has been all about for the last 14 years. And for mine is just appeal and kind of bring a light to where I think there's opportunities to do something in opening up access to markets with understanding of all the trends that are happening now in Europe for green products. Thank you. Thank you. I think the minister is an expert in that, in that question. <laughs> Thank you so she, much. She's a minister's friend. <laughs> this is just for your information. Uganda's energy mix is comprised of green energy. 94% of our energy is green. That's why I always talk about our own just transition because we are at a different level. We are investing in oil and gas to get money to work on the energy infrastructure. If you can give me the money I want to expand my transmission and distribution infrastructure, I may abandon developing oil and gas. And money for oil and gas, money for oil and gas is ring-fenced for infrastructure. But we also need a, 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 a fertilizers for production and productivity. We must feed the world. We are targeting fertilizers from oil and gas. The pharmaceuticals will need oil and gas. So for green energy, please, Uganda's energy mix is 94% green. From hydropower to solar. We are now developing geothermal. We have 24,000 megawatt capacity from nuclear. And we shall develop it for energy purposes, not for other purposes. <laughs> Nuclear energy for energy purposes. So please take heart. Uganda is green. Our energy is green. Our energy is green, madam. Thank you, Honorable Minister. And I think this very informative uh, session, I'd just like us to give a hand of applause to our distinguished speakers. Thank you so much. Thank you. And just before I leave the podium, I may not do it justice if I do not say that uh, um, I also represent the British Chamber of Commerce Uganda, which was launched last month in Kampala. So UK businesses, our Ugandan businesses that are intending to do business with the UK, please contact me or my fellow board member, Lars, who is there, and we shall direct you on how to be part of the chamber. Thank you so much down on the question, where are we? We're now at a point where when we call this session, you get all the key people, you get access. I, I, I will be honest, I've traveled to many of these conferences. I don't get a conference where I have what you see in the front row here. So we have, the, the, the conference has, has actually grown and achieved quite a lot. Many of the countries in the East African community have, uh, in the process of adapting to uh, uh, electric uh, electrification uh, for their transport. A number of them have established uh, industries. You've been told about the Kira Motors. We are, as Uganda, we are marketing the Kira Motors and uh, many, during the Northern Summit, many of the heads of state came to visit Uganda 
a number of them are placing orders to uh, access electric cars and electric buses. And uh, we are uh, working uh, along with the private sector to ensure that the electrification goes down to the population uh, with the motorcycles and other, and other facilities. Now coming to the uh, water resources, I said in my address that uh, much of the water resources of the East African community have not been uh, used. If you know the amount of water that uh, leaves the River Congo flowing just to the Atlantic, uh, we need to use that, and uh, uh, even the water on the Nile. Uh, but with, with the transboundary resources, we have legislation uh, which is uh, uh, bringing together uh, countries to work. Uh, for instance, the, the Kikagati Hydro Project, which is uh, making power both for Kenya, uh, for Tanzania and Uganda. Each has uh, seven uh, megawatts. And we, even our staff, uh, a number of them are, Kenya, are Ugandans, another of them are Ugandans. We have the Nsongezi Water Project. So we're using all the transponder resources to ensure that they benefit the East African community. So our work is going, it's work in progress. Thank you. Thank you, thank, th thank you so much. Now, since I have the microphone, I also get an advantage here. We have at least 1.5 million motorcycle taxis we call border borders. Right, so anybody who's interested in investing in that one, please talk to me, I am looking for investors. It's an amazing opportunity, the border borders represent at least 6% of our GDP, and this is the same across Africa. So you see all these motorcycle taxis, those are opportunities for investment, but uh, first one for Uganda, you come to me, East Africa. <laughs> there was a final question, please. Hello, my name is Perezi Chieng, and I'm a company called Sakoma Global Foods. We are importers and exporters of food produce. My question to uh, the team today, especially the East African, the Minister for East Africa, I'd like to see a demonstration of how the East African community works when it comes to accessing import markets or export markets. Because from our point of view, if I'm trading commodities from Kenya, and try to bulk with a commodity from Uganda, assuming it's a single market, you do not get a single certificate, for example, phytosanitary certificate. You've got to go to Uganda, you've got to go to Kenya, and forever we are shipping goods from the same common market into UK. So my question is, how does a single market work when it comes to trading common commodities? For example, coffee. For example, beans, which are big agricultural produce coming from East Africa. I'd like to see a demonstration of how this works from our point of view at its importance of people trying to open markets for Uganda, Kenya, Rwanda, and all the East African countries. It's practically impossible because of the regulations and the different agencies that we need to deal with. The second question is the partnership agreements between UK and East Africa. At the moment, there's only one partnership that exists between Kenya and UK. And so from our point of view, as a business is striving to trade with East Africa, we do not see where those agreements exist. We are depending on the Kenyan agreement with UK. And half of the time, the goods that are agreed for trading are actually not agreed between Uganda and Kenya, and UK, for example. And I'll give you one good example. Honey from UK of honey from Uganda is allowed in Kenya, in UK. Honey from Kenya is not allowed in UK. These are very simple basic commodities. We are not talking about minerals and all the other big commodity products. And these are the commodities that actually open up markets and opportunity for smallholder farmers, you know, building impact on what we're trying to say, social impact for everyday people. And if we can't do these simple common trades for commodities, how are we gonna do the big ones? Okay. Thank you. Very key questions. I'm going to ask our PSSD to start with the last question, and then we might come back to you just to come back with the first one. Thank you. I thought you, with my boss here, the minister responsible for East Africa, uh, should it be uh, talking about this? Because I, I, I come on the economics bit, which also I join her, on the non-tariff barriers. So the, the, the Honorable Minister would be in a better position to answer this. Yeah, thank you very much for the question. During my presentation, I said we have four pillars of integration. 
we have achieved the customs union and the common market uh, to an extent. We have not yet done the monetary union, but the very important one is the political federation. We don't yet have a country called East Africa. Therefore, the issues of sovereignty still come into play. Uh, if you, uh, we had uh, originally, we had said, let's move together on everything. Now, for the economic partnership agreements, we had wanted to move together, but Kenya moved alone. We couldn't stop them because of our sovereign right. So, because of the issue of sovereignty, we are still doing a few things on our own. But uh, if we can move the political fo uh, federation, it will help us to organize together. As it is, I can't stop the Minister of Finance of uh, Tanzania from organizing his market. I can't stop the South Sudan people from organizing their market. So we're waiting for that political federation. About the non tariff barriers, yes, it is still a problem. It's something that we fight constantly. We agree and then uh, other people are moving in a different direction. Against issues about how does the Minister of Finance of Kenya raise his resources? How does the Uganda Minister raise, how does Ramadan raise his money? So it's, it's really an issue of sovereignty and I, if we can solve that, we are we are, we'll, we'll get to where we want to go. If that is the ultimate uh, hope. It's our desire to move together as uh, uh, the East African uh, community. Thank you.